Hi, Manuel. Hi. How you doing? Ah, great. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. So for those uh, office hours, do you still need stuff? I would love to have volunteers, yes. <laughs> um, want to sign up for one or the, both? The office hours, uh, so I, we recently got notice of our times and uh, I looked it up to make an entry in our meeting minutes. Now, uh, it seems to be an RSV uh, uh, reservation process where with the Linux Foundation, you need an account, uh, you RSVP, you get this um, accepted and then yeah, it's like a like a um, shopping basket. So I'm a bit slow now. Um, yeah, so I, I don't like the process of office hours, but it seems more like an organized one-hour meeting. Um, so do you are you going to treat it more as like a flyby, random questions answered? I could probably yeah, attend that's unless unless there is really good talk going on in parallel. Um, well, but, I, yeah. hmm. I, I'm not aware of this. Yeah, I'm not aware of the sign up thing that you're referring to, because to be honest, aside from uh, asking for those specific times, I haven't really done anything with it. So hold on, let me see. Where is that? Well, tell you what, since we have, when is it? It's not till May. Tell you what, let me, let me do some investigation, but are you willing to sign up for a for like one of these two slots or do you need to still figure out what's going on that day for you? I haven't gone through my scheduling yet of talks, but I, I think I can uh, make room for one of those. Okay. So yeah, okay, let me do some investigation and see what the process is like to actually sign up. Because to be honest, I thought last time it was more just sort of a random stop by kind of thing where some yeah, of us agreed to channel. be there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so let, let me do some investigation and find out. Um, let's see. Um, David. Good morning, afternoon. Hello. Hey. Uh, yo, Tommy. Yo. Yo. And uh, Matt. Hey, Doug. Hello. Oh, I completely misspelled that. There we go. No, still way off. Jeez. That was neat. Hold on. If I misspell it, it, it tried show. to correct it. Yeah, but what's interesting is for a split second there, it showed me an alternative spelling, but the right spelling. Oh, I can't make it do it anymore. Let me try it again. Hold on. Now, there it is. So I, now if I hover over it. Yeah, see, it knows. That's amazing. I've noticed it's getting, it's adding a, some interesting features like that um, recently in terms of spell checks or autocorrect and stuff like that. I've noticed some, every now and then they sneak in these changes. It's kind of neat. Sorry, I'm easily distracted. Um, <laughs> where are we? Ginger. Hey, Doug. Hello. Uh, Jesse. Good morning. Good morning. And Klaus. Hi, Doug. Hello. I know I've seen it before, but who is Linux Basic? Hey, hello. Hello. You want to come? You want to tell us your real name, maybe in the in the chat, and I'll add it to the attendee list. So I have problems with my audio. I'm sorry. Say that again. I have problems with my audio. A moment, please. That's fine. You can also just type it into the chat. That works as well. And let's see, Eric. Hello, Doug. Hello, and Mr. John. Hello. Hello. And uh, da -da -da -da, Lucas. Hi. Hello. Uh, da -da -da -da, Slinky. Hello. Hey, and Scott. Morning. Hello. Do, 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 do. 
do 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 do. Thank you, thank you, Manuel, for that. Lance. Hello. Hello. Christoph, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Hey, Doug, Christian here. Oh, there we go. I thought I saw someone sneak in there. Okay, hey, Christian. Thanks. All right, another 30 seconds or so, then we get started. Lucas, the other Lucas, are you there? Holmquist? Lucas, are you there? Excellent. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, it's three after. Why don't I go ahead and get started? 18 people. All right, let's see. Um, ba -dum -bum -bum. Okay, ooh, I just realized I completed this PR. All right, uh, community time. Anything from the community people want to bring up that's not on the agenda? Nope. Okay, cool. Moving forward. Um, we had no SDK call last week because there are no topics. I do want to have an interop call this week, if even if it's short. So please, if you're doing interop stuff, please hang on the line after this call ends. Um, we need to have some talks. Office hours. Um, still looking for volunteers. Um, Mel, Manuel indicated that there's um, a process involved in actually signing up for that. I was going to do a little bit of investigation to see what that involved. So thank you for the links there. Whoa. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> um, so anyway, don't need to do anything, anything there other than if you do know you can sign up for one of those particular days, it'd be great if you could stick your name here or just let me know and I will uh, put your name there. We do need some volunteers. And again, if you're interested, you can see Remy's slides and video that he submitted for our stuff. Uh, let's see, Timur, I don't see him on the call and he hasn't reached out to me, so nothing to update there. So before we get into the bulk of the show, let me go ahead and accept these changes from Scott. So Scott, maybe you can talk about your process you wanted to suggest we might use for tracking changes. Sure. Do you yeah. want to share something or just talk to it? Oh, it's it's just we could go to those links if you want. Um, so I, I you know day to day I work on Knative, but we pulled the CNCF. Uh, 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 Kubernetes process for generating release notes. And it's, so we happen to use a GitHub action to go and extract that between two hashes in the repo. Uh, oh yeah, I see you're preloading. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the thing that's most important. Okay, so stop here. So okay. uh, to remember to do this, we make a little comment in when you're composing the PR and then you see the little tick, tick, tick release note. Uh, not that one, the, oh, the tricks. yes. Sorry. So this is the magic piece that the script knows to extract a little code block. And it basically is going to assemble those into organized areas. And so it's as simple as if there's something that's interesting or important for a user to remember or a release to know about, uh, you write that text inside the release note block. And then if you go to the tab one over, this script from Kubernetes goes and runs and extracts this. And now there's some pieces that it assumes, like there's special labels that Kubernetes uses to go and organize the output a little better. Those are optional. We can ignore those. We don't have to use labels, uh, but we could use this script to go and slurp up all those release notes that are in PRs between two hashes. 
this hard because you have to run it locally, which is why if you go to the next tab over, uh, Knative has adopted this GitHub action that we could go and copy. Uh, it runs between two hashes and it does some default lookups that may or may not work for cloud events. Uh, but it's a, it's a manual run. Uh, you give it some hashes and it outputs an artifact, um, a markdown artifact. And I, maybe, I, sorry, I could, I could find a result here. Uh, one second. Oops. So I, you know, it's, um, the output is fairly messy and it requires a little bit of editing because it's optimized Wait, is, for- Is there a screen as you're bringing up? I, I'm, I'm getting you a link one second. Oh, okay, cool. There we go. So where did that, on the document again. <laughs> so here we go. So as an example, this is a run from a Knative eventing. And you can, if you scroll it down a little bit, um, there's an actual markdown file you can download and edit. If you expand the release notes, it kind of shows you the script running and there's an output there too. Uh, not that important, but basically we use this as a, a starting point to write release notes for releases when we go and actually do releases. We, Knative does them every six weeks. And so some of the action is optimized to kind of look up the hash, the two hashes that we should look at, and then it extracts using the Kubernetes script, the, the code block. And that's, that's, that's basically it. There's not a lot of magic. Um, there's a lot more magic you can use if you use the, the labels that Kubernetes uses. They're also prow based, so there's like, uh, slash kind labels that get applied, but uh, those are optional again. So just to be clear, it sounds like the biggest thing that we're looking at here is this type of mechanism versus the prefix thingy and the commit. I think that's the biggest change between the two different proposals. Is that fair? Yeah. My, my only hesitation with the, um, what is it called? Like conventional commits is that it's fairly magical and you have to remember or kind of understand how the parser is going to work. And this is literally just anything that's in this release notes block gets uh, exported by the tool. And then you're free to go and edit the release by hand uh, to make it look pretty. Okay. Just out of curiosity, does, this, does, the, does the bot pick it up only in the first comment of the PR or any comment in the PR? It looks for, there should be only one release note block. Um, but the difference here is that this is on the pull request comment, not the commit. Right. But it is just the first comment in the commit, in the PR, I assume, right? No, it doesn't look, well, you could choose to do that, but this is a tool that interacts with GitHub, not commits. No, understood. But I mean, is if, you, if, you, if I put this section in like the third comment in a PR, if I would only... notice it. I think if there's only one of them, yes. Okay, because cool. we also, I mean, if we smash it, then there will only, only be one. But I'd, okay. I'd have to check. It, it may be smart enough to extract more than one, but I don't, I don't know. Usually, it's yeah. in the body of the PR, not the commit. No, I think, yeah, I, I, maybe I wasn't clear. I was saying comment, not commit. So I was, I was oh, talking about the oh, PR oh, itself. Oh. No, it must be in the the. Um, it must be in the, the, the main uh, body of the, of the commit, the thing right. that actually goes into um, the Git history. Right. Okay. Hang on, I'm okay. now. Cool. Sorry. <clears throat> Before we were saying it was in the PR, not in the commit. Now you're saying it needs to be in, in the commit, well, which it... is what's in the Git history. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understood Doug's question of, does it need to be in sort of the main PR comment or could it be in the conversation as it were? Um, right, it has to be in the, the, um, the original body of the, of the, if you go and look at a, any PR, like in any repo. Right, the, the initial comment. Um, yeah. And is it okay for it to be, presumably 
it can be supplied later or edited. It doesn't have to be in the, the main PR comment when the PR was first created. It could be in, you know, we can, um, we can change it as, as the PR evolves slightly and effectively it's something to review as, as well as the, the commit. That, that's exactly right. You, uh, you can edit the, the body of your commit message the, the summary part where, you know, if you go and you make a PR, uh, PR you can say the, the little right box uh, under the title, the first one. Yeah. Uh, GitHub doesn't seem to label that, but it's, it says a comment, but it, yeah. Yes. The, the first comment within the PR. That's yeah. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Okay. Any other questions for Scott? I mean, is everything clear in terms of the way this works? It sounds like there's lots of, options available to us, but at the bare minimum, it's adding this to the PR comment <laughs> and then running a bot that extracts it. I mean, and, and those, the bot stuff as well, the uh, action is optional, right? You can run the tool locally. It's just, uh, you have to run it correctly and you right. have to make sure that you have all of the history pulled down locally, which is yeah. the, the niceness of not doing it locally. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of assuming we don't need to talk too much about that in, in the sense that that's sort of my problem in the sense that I'm probably the one gonna be running the release notes. I'm just trying to figure out for the average PR creator, what do they need to do? And it sounds like the difference is this section versus a prefix on their commit. I'm intrigued as to how, how it would do it locally because what you have locally is the Git commit history, not the PR history. The PRs only exist on GitHub, so I don't. Yeah. I think it uses the GitHub API, so you have to have a right. GitHub okay. token to go and run the the script because it goes and looks right. at the Git history and then picks out the commits that landed that are associated with the commits in the your raw history. All makes sense now. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Any questions on this particular mechanism? Okay. Does anybody have any questions about the mechanism that's currently checked into our repo, meaning the conventional commits thing where you have to put the prefix on the PR commit message itself? Oh, here we go. Here's an example from Slinky for release notes. So here's how the release notes appears. And so the bat, the bot will pick it up. <clears throat> All right, um, so I guess the question before the group is, does anybody have a preference between those two mechanisms? I quite like the fact that the release note can be uh, discussed um, on the PR um, without it having to be part of the commit message. That feels quite nice. On the other hand, it does make it slightly harder to if you've only got the commit history. Uh, yeah. Does the change uh, log link to each PR? Scott? So it, if you go back to uh, maybe that, maybe the first tab the, or the, the last tab that has the result. This one? Yeah, and then click on the release notes and it might download something or actually, sorry, uh, expand release notes, this little green checkbox, if you click that, Oh, there we go. And then expand display notes. Just display note. Where is it? Oh, there it is. And then, so this is what it it makes. So it's the commit, and then it's context. It's the author it, and and some other stuff. So that's what these things are turning into. And the the enhancement API change. Those come from the labels. If there if there is no label on the PR, it gets uncategorized. But it sounds to me, because I, I think the, the bulk or the main point of Lance's question was the, sort of the linking mechanism between the commits versus the PR. And I think what you're saying, Scott, is that regardless of how it happens, it does go to the PR to get the information, whether it actually starts out and only looks at the PRs or within the range of the SHAs or whether it starts, goes from the commits in the range of the SHAs and finds the PRs. Either way, the PR comment is the source of truth for the data that's going to get extracted, right? 
That's right. That's right. Does that answer your question, Lance? Yeah. I also like using labels for the different categories like API changer, um, bug, or regression, uh, because it is a finite set of stuff. One of the difficulties I have with the conventional commits is I don't remember, is it supposed to be docs or doc? Or is it, you know, is it supposed to be chore or source? You know, I, I just don't always remember what the tags are supposed to be. So the labels, that's a nice improvement, I think. I'm glad to hear you say that because I know you guys use the conventional commits in your um, uh, JavaScript repo. And so I'm, I'm, I, I love, I like, I like getting your input because as somebody who actually uses the other mechanism. So that's good. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I, I really like it. Um, and I like some of the other stuff that it enables um but yeah <laughs> um it's not perfect yeah okay um anybody else want to chime in i see slinky said he prefers release notes anybody else want to speak up okay i i'll, I'll raise my hand i i actually could not ever get the conventional stuff to work um until yesterday and then I finally figured out what I was doing wrong. And, and, and I have to admit, there was some nicety to it of, of just setting a little label in front of my commit message. That was kind of neat. Um, but at the same time, I think I'm leaning a little more towards this, I think because of what John was saying, which is it's nice to be able to separate out the commit from this text, especially if the text wants to get, needs to get updated later on after the PR has already been merged and stuff like that having it in the PR itself gives you that freedom to wordsmith it later and tweak it, or even, you know, right before you actually generate the release notes, right? At the last minute you realize, oh, we, we, we renamed something. So really we should update the release notes everywhere to, to say this, right, you know, to use the right terminology. I like that level of freedom, um, but I don't know. Um, okay, so John says you prefer the release notes. Yeah, we're repositing the release notes would be good too. That's a good point, John. Okay. Does anybody want to voice an opinion strongly one way or the other? Or I think mean, actually rephrase this. So we've already got people expressing a preference for release notes. Does anybody want to advocate for keeping what we have today, which is the conventional tagging thing? I don't think Grant Timmerman is on the call, uh, who has previously been I wouldn't say a, a particularly fierce advocate, but has spoken about it before. Um, so it may be worth making sure we have his input. Yes, I was definitely not gonna do an, uh, um, a finalized vote on the call here. Rather, if we choose to head towards the release notes thing that Scott is presenting here, I was gonna send out a note and let people who could not make the phone call get a chance to, to voice their opinion. And it's obviously Grant would be one of those folks. The, the one caveat I, I will make is that the, the release note tool is made for Kubernetes. So it's not a copy and paste the result into our release notes. It's going to be a, it's a good starting point. We'll do a, some minor editing around, like you can see the, you know, the documentation link is to kates.io, things like that, right? Like we'll have to change that stuff because it's part of the script, but the logic that the script does wouldn't have to change. Okay, so the script that actually does this is something that we could <clears throat> basically check into our repo? No, I, it's a Golang tool that runs. It's not okay, a script. But we, have, but we have access to the source code and we can create our own copy of it. If we needed to, yeah. Um, I would okay. recommend not and just doing the legwork of doing modifications to the okay. resulting document. Okay, well, at least we have, we have the options. That's good. Okay, so back to the question. I've heard lots of people saying <clears throat> uh, they like this mechanism. Does anybody want to speak in favor of keeping what we have today? Okay, so I'll tell you what, any objection then to making that our current tentative agreement contingent upon no one in the community screaming at us for choosing this option? In particular, I'll double check and see if Grant's okay with it. I'm not sure why that's not working. Gosh, I can't type. Okay, not hearing any objection. We'll go with tentative approval. Cool. Thank you, Scott, for that presentation. All right, before we jump into 
PRs and stuff. Is there any work item that I forgot to add to our list, PR or not, before we, that we should talk about before we get to the PRs? All right, in that case, let's jump into it. Do, do, do. Where's close? All right. Um, I know you made a, some couple of minor changes in here based on my comments, but I don't think it was anything substantive. Is there anything else you'd like to mention, John, on this one before we ask for any uh, final comments or questions? As discussed, um, this is currently headed to 101, but we probably want to move it to master so that it can be part of 102 branch when that is cut, I think, but we can discuss that when the when we've got the meat of it done, as it were. Uh, none of the changes that I've been making have changed the intended semantics at all. Uh, they've just been clarifications. Yep. Okay. Does any, I know this has about been out there, I think now for about three weeks, so it definitely has had time to to gel. Anybody have any questions or comments for John? Okay. Any objection to approving? Okay. One quick question then. Uh, Clemens, welcome back from vacation or wherever you were. Did you get a chance to look at this? Because I know you were the, I believe, if I remember correctly, you were one of the original main authors of the HTTP protocol spec. Did you get a chance to look at this and you're okay with it? Um, did, so John, John made the change. Yes. I shall, I shall trust John. Shall I? Good answer. Uh, 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 <laughs> I, I would be happier if you didn't, um, just cause this is all quite sensitive stuff. If, if we get it wrong, uh, we're kind of screwed. So, um, I, I would be very happy if Clemens, you, you could, uh look at it in the next you know couple of days and if we can get a tentative agreement if clemens is okay with it then it could be merged in a few days that's absolutely Wait, fine uh, I, will, I will promise that i will look at it to, uh tomorrow or, or between now and tomorrow and you will know tomorrow that would be fantastic that makes me happier than blanket trust which i never feel i quite deserve <laughs> <laughs> okay cool all right do we have tentative approval from the group then? Okay, not hearing objection. Can I say? Can I say one thing? Sure, of course. I, the, 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 it, it honors me that I that I that you guys treat me like that. Thank you. <laughs> that? I, there you go. Make it even better. Yes, yes I yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm I'm just as flattered as John was just about me giving him trust. You know. Yes, it's always, yes. Um, John will quickly learn that's a mistake, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you, John, for all the work on that. I really appreciate so, it. So just, just before we go on to the next one, if there yeah. is approval, which branch do we want it in? Oh, yes, thank you for answering that. Um, so to refresh everybody's memory, oh, oh, I wanna say maybe a month or month and a half ago, we agreed that rather than rolling out brand new release version numbers every time we find a typo, we were just gonna merge those typos directly into the latest release, which as of right now is 101. However, we agreed that anything bigger than a typo should warrant a new patch release number. So I think according to those rules, this one should be targeted towards master, and then we need to decide when we're gonna create a 102 release. Please, anybody speak up if you think I'm remembering correctly in terms of the process we agreed to. Okay, so let me turn that around just to make sure. Does anybody believe the change we just approved is in the category of a typo that should just be blindly merged into 101? Okay. I don't think it, I don't think it'd be honest or fair of us to say it's a typo. It's pretty no. it's pretty big. <laughs> no. I think the next one, given that it's uh, to do with the primer, so is let's say informative rather than normative, that might be treated differently, and maybe we need to be uh, update the governance rules to to decide whether the primer gets special treatment given that it's informative. But okay, and yeah, we can have that discussion in a sec. Hello, there we go. All right, anything, let me hide comments. 
John, anything on this one worthy of mentioning? I think all changes recently were relatively minor as well. Uh, so the most significant change in the last week after, I think it was Eric's um, excellent comments, were restructuring it a bit so that, uh, aside from anything else, the paragraph that's in the center now, event producers are encouraged to consider versioning from the outset and uh, document it. Uh, that's now much earlier than it was, which makes me happy. Um, and then type and data schema are called out into separate subheadings and each dealt with thoroughly rather than doing both of them lightly and then both of them um, in more detail. And I agree with uh, Eric that it's now clearer. Okay, and the change down here is just changing URLs, so that's good. Okay, <clears throat> any questions for John or concerns? Okay, any objection to approving then? Okay, not hearing any. So now we can go back to John's second question is, currently is targeted for 101. Since these changes are just to the primer, if you exclude the, the URL changes into the spec, should we push these changes directly into 101 or have them wait for a 102? Anybody have any opinion on that? I would vote for 101 myself. <laughs> okay. I don't have a strong opinion, but I was leaning actually a little more towards the other way, but honestly, I don't care that much because as you said, it is just the primer. Um, the only reason I would say that is because this to me doesn't say typo, but as you said, it is just the primer and it is clarification. It's good clarification, but still it's, it's bigger than a typo to me. But like I said, I don't care enough to- I agree to it's go a typo. I'm, I'm happy to take an action. I need to look at the governance doc anyway, and I'm happy to take an action to draft a PR for us to consider for um, ironing out a few things like if it's only informative rather than normative, then it sort of counts as keep it in the same branch. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, so like, yeah, if, if you're going to PR that change to the governance doc, um, then I'm okay with, with going to 101 because that's where we're going to be and I'm okay with that. So you, you, you convinced me. Cool. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Raises the question next time of, does the governance change itself have to go into 102? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Actually, what's funny is, you, it's funny you say that because the governance change that I pointed you to, that's only in master. It's not in 101. Uh, right. <laughs> Which is why you probably didn't see it. Indeed. <laughs> yes. So that is, that is an excellent question. So yeah, we should probably resolve that at the same time as well. Um, all right, so anyway, back to the original question. Since this has been approved, does anybody object to it going into 101 directly? Oh, Scott, your hands up. So what we do in the Golang SDK is we have a release 1.0 branch, say, and then we make patch releases off of that that are tagged. So it kind of avoids this, like there, we would have a uh, version one branch that, you cut uh, patch releases off of, but it's a little different because it's not just text, it's code. So people have to import it. So maybe we mm -hmm. maybe we got a free foot gun here because we called it a 101.1 versus a the 10 seed branch that gets patches and maybe tagged with releases. So let me ask you about that. Cause, and this is more of a, I guess a, a Git question. I don't think it's a GitHub question. I think it's a Git question. When you did that, did you create a one zero a one zero zero branch or tag? Or just, no, you actually, I'm sorry, you said you just create a one zero branch. So did you ever create a one zero zero? Yeah. So know, I'm you can say. <laughs> you can look in the Go SDK, but yeah. so what we do is we make a release dash uh, one dot zero branch because we want to we want to be able to service bug fixes on individual minor bumps, but uh, we don't have we want we want to like figure out how, what where it was branched from and then make a new fork and all this other stuff. So the simpler process that we use is you make a a branch that's labeled the major minor, but not the patch. Right. From that branch, we label 
uh, of the, the patch version. So uh, v1.0.0. If we make right, bug okay. fixes, they go into the branch, the, the major minor branch, and then the new release is cut from the major minor branch again. Right, I, but I think I now remember why I, I ran into issues here. I think the default branch, I'm sorry, the default thing that's shown here cannot be a tag, can it? Doesn't it have to be a branch? It, it doesn't need to be because you have the, the v1.0 seed branch Re individual releases. So basically you're, you're always pointing people to the latest version of the, the oh, major minor of the it. spec, got it, got but it, got you can it. have, okay. you can have released versions using tags. So you can go back in history. Got it. And I think, I think the reason I ran into issues, and this is probably my own mistake is I created a 101, one, 100 branch and a 100 tag, which is technically legal. It's just really confusing in terms of which one you're actually referencing when you, when you issue a command. And you're saying basically you avoided that because you never created a 100 uh, tag. You only created a 10 branch, and your first tag after that was 101. That yeah, right? our convention is to use release dash major dot minor with no version to avoid any actions that may run on branches that have, or branches or tags that have the V prefix. Okay. But okay. that's, that's just we, what we do. Uh, yeah. you know. No, it's a good thing. I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I need to go off and, and think about that because I'm not happy with the way we have it today. So let me go off and see if we can tweak things the way you just described it and see whether I run into any issues. Um, so thank you for that. But to the overall question, going back to the, the high order bit here, uh, anybody object to merging this into the current 101 branch? Okay, so John, I think you actually still need the other PR to catch it into master. Otherwise we lose these changes the next time we cut a 102, right? Yes, so, so is, is it simpler just to put it, just to go on to master and I'd, ah. <laughs> I'm very confused now. It, it feels to me like maybe our default branch should be, yeah, I, I would support the going to major dot minor as a branch rather than a branch for every patch release. Um, but I'm happy to make as many PRs as we want for the moment to get this in. It's, yeah, so I, I think- my, The final yeah, thing ahead, I'll Scott. say, so the, yeah. the process that we would use would be you make a PR to go into the mainline branch. So in this case, I think it's called master. Make the, make the PR for master. And then you make another PR that cherry picks that commit into the release branch. The major minor branch. Either way, it's two PRs as of today, anyway. It, it would be two PRs. Yeah, there's no way around that. And hopefully, if the change you know isn't conflicting with the cherry pick, then it just works out. It's a little bit more work for you to, to make the second PR tar targeting the major minor branch if there are conflicts. But I think the process should always be all big changes land in the head first, and then they get cherry picked into the release branches that they apply to. So that would that would also go for the governance docs that we were talking about. Does that make sense, John? I think so. So uh, for right now, um, I will create. Uh, I would suggest that you, Doug, don't merge anything at the moment. I will um, create a version of this PR for the master branch, um, probably as a new PR. I seem to remember that retargeting things in GitHub may be tricky. I'm not sure. Um, I will wait for that to be merged, then pull everything, then cherry pick to create another PR for the 101 branch, and then we can work out what to do in the future. Yep. Um, and yes, I uh, just to... Echo Scott, I would be very happy if we renamed from master to main as well. But that's a separate. Yeah, yeah that, that's on our to-do list. It's just that we were waiting for the GitHub to have the right tooling in place. And now that they have it, we can do that. So yeah. Right. Cool. All right. So what I said down here was it's been approved. And uh, oh, hold on, I meant to say John. John will PR for both master and 101. And then I'll wait until that's done before I uh, do any uh, merging. 
I, I will create it for master. If you could then merge that, I will pull and then cherry pick, I think is probably the, um, it's possible that I could do the cherry pick off my, ver uh, my copy, but um, it seems easier if it's against one that's been merged into master already. Whatever makes you happy, John. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty, cool. All right. Are we done with John's? I believe so. All right, let's go to Jim then. Do, 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 do. Jim, where are we on this one? I can't remember. Wow. Well, I just I, I just wanted to check actually if um, if John accepts this, does that mean Clements accepts it as well? I, I just want to understand what the chain of trust is. <laughs> Anyway. But, but did, I don't know if but I don't I, I, I don't know if you heard it, but in, right as you were coming online, Clemens made some like groan or something in the background, or is that a wow, Clemens? I couldn't I can't tell what that sound was. No, I was just laughing. Okay. Yeah, like, what? You mean, uh, XML? I thought XML was like wow. Yeah, that's what I well, thought I heard. I thought I heard a wow. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, it was you know there was an open issue, and I did. Uh, open the original PR on April the 1st, um, but that, you know, <laughs> you, you, you can read into that whatever you will. Um, is it but really? I mean, I, it yeah. is. Oh, my God, you're right. <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. I didn't notice. Oh, sorry. I, I was a little bit too subtle there. And actually, you'll, you'll, see, in, you'll see in that PR my attempt, because I thought the conventional commit stuff applied at the PR level as well. So I actually wow. tried to... Uh, make that work anyway um yeah so uh, john and uh slinky and i, I think somebody else had, had left some comments on this um there are a couple of things that uh, i need to tidy um there's some of the um commentary uh, and it sounds a bit redundant i know given we're talking about xml but um i had taken a very um uh, terse approach to this in an attempt to keep the you know the payload payload sizes down uh, to a certain extent uh, it's just a model i've used in the past um if that you know if people don't like that i'm more than happy to change i don't think that should prevent anything from moving forward and uh, so but i think i i'm uh, and john you know feel free to jump in it, it sounds like that this may be a, that might be a discussion more in this group, you know, rather than trying to just go backwards and forwards on it on the uh, the PR structure. Absolutely, but, yes. Um, <laughs> yes. So uh, there were a couple of nits um, which I've addressed. Some of them, um, uh, one of them, I think, which I still haven't got my head around, is my my mental failing on. Uh, XML schemas, uh, and that's probably because it's just so long since I've done one. Uh, so there are there are maybe some clarifications to do in the schema itself. Uh, but aside from that, I think you know structurally, um, I think it's basically uh, it, it should be in a reviewable state. I mean, John, did did you want to comment at all? Uh, only to say my knowledge of XML schema is far inferior to yours. Oh, um, I, st <laughs> I still don't quite know what the XSNE is going to allow. Um, I guess what I probably do is take the schema and try it against a bunch of XML. Uh, so I, I think the only bit of the schema that I'm uncertain around um, is the, uh, yeah, that the XML element that includes right. um, that XSNE. I don't quite know what that will do. Can you have just text? Does it have to be an element that can then do anything? And I don't know what that ends up as in a uh, in an SDK either. Um, I kind of I think I understand the overall aim to be a little bit like the data property within JSON that lets it be an arbitrary JSON token. Um, I think that a subtle difference in XML is in terms of what what that can be. I think it can only be, we would have to make it only an element or there's no sort of one token type, I don't think. Um, yeah. No, I'm not sure. No, I, I, I think you're right. And, and then that was probably my mental, uh, say my mental lapse, because it is meant to be any element, not 
not any random construct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You need, I think you need to have, um, I, I promptly remember more about XML schema than I really want, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the choice is great. Um, and I think you need to have on um, choice, um, you're making either a bin or takes take txt and then you're doing or or um, an any, which means you don't have an element that's named XML, but you have you put the any right there, because that's already being an exclusive choice by way of being uh, within the the choice. I think that's how I remember it. And then on all the other complex types, just for future extensibility, because we might be adding something. If you make, if you don't add the the any attribute in any um, uh, definition there, you can't expand the type anymore. So so we'll basically have to go in, in on the cloud event, for instance, in the complex type. There needs to be a an any at the end of it so that we can go and add stuff later. But right. I have to go. I have to go and look look up how that actually. Or probably we all have to go look up how that actually works again. Wouldn't that make stuff valid that contains utter garbage? Um, I would have expected that when we want to add stuff in the future, we modify the schema to say, okay, now this is allowed, and it wouldn't be valid in the old schema, and it would be valid in the new schema. I'd yeah. expect that to be okay, rather than we'll just allow anything, and it might take on some meaning later on. I have been, I have been um, on this matter. I have had exactly that stance uh, in my younger years, and then have been schooled by Sam Ruby that that's really terrible, and um, I shouldn't be doing those things. Um, so I have to, I have to go, I have to go and 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 reread where I was there from a mental from a mental state. But I am, I have the 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 Sam Ruby perspective of be very permissive of what you allow there because that's going to make you happier in the long run. Yeah. John, are you gonna, you're, you're going to make us revisit our entire extension mechanism, aren't you? Because that's what <laughs> extensions are for, right? Yes. <laughs> and and you know, we've got that flexibility for extensions yeah. or arbitrary. Well, it's an XML, you know, almost any XML document is a valid cloud event. Um, it just have, has to have a few little bits. Um, I don't know. I, I tend to be against the be permissive with what you ex accept. Just to go back, because uh, I suspect that's a rabbit hole, um, on the XML element in the cloud event data, I think we do want the XML element itself, because otherwise, if someone wanted to represent an arbitrary XML element that happened to be called TXT, yes. we don't want that to be confused with a text element. Yeah, that, that was the intent. So it was meant to be an enclosing element of anything else you'd want to put inside it. Yeah. Uh, isn't that isn't that a, a um, isn't that a namespace problem? Say that again. Sorry, Clemens. Is, is that a namespace problem? Well, namespaces you'll notice I've veered away from completely in this because which, um, it's a different ball of wax altogether. Because there is a there is an ex, there's a clause in any, God, I, I, you activated synapses that I never wanted to see again. Um, the the uh, there's a clause in any that it must be from a different namespace, which means you can go and avoid that clash. Yeah, I to be honest, this schema itself is not in a namespace namespace at the moment. Um, it probably should be. Yeah, it need, it need to be. So that's a change for me. Yes. And See, it was it was worth you coming on the call this week. Yes. It'll, it'll with, with, with with practice of so I personally wish that XML namespaces would never have invented because that would have kept XML simpler. But since they have been, I think we need to use them. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, but I so I think that um, the bigger discussion for the group is really you know how terse do we want to be um and i know some of you may work for cloud providers that like to charge people as data goes in and out of their environment um but um you know uh, 
for me, it's always been an efficiency play. Uh, and as I said last week, I, I, uh, I rail against human readability sometimes because they need to be humanly understandable. Um, but it's computers that are going to be interpreting it, not people. So, you know, whether I use one letter or 25 doesn't make any difference at the end of the day, except from an efficiency perspective. So that, that's my position, but I'm, you know, I'll go with a crowd if that's what you want. Yes, sorry. And I noticed you, you've highlighted that other one there, Doug. Um, I should remove that. That was my poor attempt because originally um, I had specification version called out specific, uh, explicitly um, as an attribute or an element rather. Um, and then I mentally went, oh, well, there's got to be three more. Uh, but obviously, that's nonsense because it could be any three. Um, so I should just uh, make that zero, basically. And then it becomes well, that, a, yeah, that, that, that's, that's why I highlighted it, because I thought that was yeah. your kind of indirect, sneaky way of saying, hey, there are some required ones. I just can't figure out an yeah. XML how to make it, which ones are required. But at least, no. we know there have to be at least three, right? Well, I mean, yeah, without listing them all explicitly. Um, there's no real way to do it. So, I mean, I'll just, um, I'll make that a zero and then it'll just be a, a usage model to make sure that the right ones are there. Okay, uh, Slinky, your hands up. Yeah, so for me, uh, I tend to agree with the performance, um, with efficiency uh, discussion, but like, for example, uh, the attribute names should should map the spec. So, like spec ver, for in my opinion, should be spec version. Like okay. I, I prefer I prefer that we cut some bytes somewhere else, by like keeping the consistency of the attribute names. In my opinion, is, is important. So, so where they're called out explicitly, use use them. You know, using common language. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I think yeah. the specification version is the only one. Um, that would fall into that category. Yeah, spec version. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, John, your hands up. Yeah, potentially bonkers idea. Um, could we have two schemas, one with sort of one the readable version, one the um, abbreviate even further, so call the data elements B, D, uh, sorry, B, T, and X, um, and declare that they are absolutely equivalent. You know, something has to be one or the other, but uh, you could have a, the element being CE instead of cloud event and you know, really, really compress it down as much as you want to and mandate that any spec implementing this must treat them the same way. Um, and you specify whether you want the verbose or the um, concise version when you format things. So, so you're asking for two XML schemas? Two XML schemas that we would uh, keep absolutely in sync. And you know, as I'm saying this, it sounds <laughs> kind of crazy, but equally I can see it having quite significant potential benefits um, in terms of, right, I'm doing a debugging session. I will turn it into the slightly more readable form. Okay, now I'm back into production. I will go into concise mode. So that I... Uh... I'm just putting my SDK writer hat on now. I'm, I'm trying to understand what that means to uh, uh, an SDK. Um, Slinky might want to comment on this as well. I mean, it, it, essentially that would mean I would, in the Java SDK, I'd write two format providers um, that would produce different formats, but both consume produce independent formats, but mm. consume both formats. Is that what you're saying? Possibly. I, this is an idea I've only just had. So the number of <laughs> holes in it, it may be more fishing net than, um, <laughs> than watertight. Slinky, your hands up. It sounds incredibly complex. Yeah. And more <laughs> complex than it should be. Uh, I, I, my, my, my question is simple. Is this something that uh, you tend to do to do when using XML tooling, or is this something that nobody does? So it, it, I mean, if it, if it's idiomatic to do that in the with XML, then that's good. 
As I don't so think I, I've worked with any XML documents that are abbreviated to this extent, and I don't think I would want to. Right, and, and so since I can't raise my hand, let me do it here. I, I'm leaning more towards what Slinky's saying. Um, well, I can definitely appreciate, Jim, your desire for compactness. Um, as somebody who n almost never uses tooling, including back in the days when we were doing SOAP stuff, I never used the WSDL to whatever generators. So I hand coded everything. The idea of asking me to code up to be able to, to spit out and accept multiple types of XML for the exact same document, just sounds like my head's gonna explode and I'm gonna get pissed off very, very quickly. Right. Likewise, if we're gonna use it, it, when the cloud event attributes appear someplace, I think we have to use the names that are in the spec. Yeah. If for no other reason, what you're doing by doing this is you're going to confuse people because what if they had to find an extension called specver? Right. Yeah. No, right? I, I get it. Okay. Yes. So that one I accept. I, if, if we look, maybe look at the, um, the actual markdown document and see whether the produced formats or the examples actually look um actually that one needs editing doesn't it because that's wrong um like this yeah so that's what it would end up looking like this seems to be out of sync i thought i'd push changes that synchronize this a bit more but that why wouldn't the the elements be id and time and type right so th th this is what i've struggled with um I could add those. We would still end up with a bag, I think, to hold all of the um, extensions. Um, and also, I, I guess I, w I started down the road of creating all the different element types to represent all the um, you know, value types that we pass around. And this, did, I just refactored it into one flat. Um, thing yeah so I didn't have to look at it and go oh what sort of element is this you know is it meant to be a string is it meant to be a number is it meant to be a, uh, a timestamp um, but that you can do that in, so in the schema you would go and, and effectively constrain the 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 elements Yes, yeah, you, you you absolutely can but then when you get to extensions you come back to this model again. Yeah, because now it's very much like what I ended up doing with protobuf, which I'm still not entirely sure I was happy with, in that um, you've got two different models. Yeah, you've got a model for an attribute that is defined by the spec, so you know what type it's meant to be. But then you have these other attributes, which are extensions, which are um, untyped. Well, um, they yes, you know, so, so, so to be able to not, you know, and I'm a big fan of not losing type information, you would, you end up with your extensions having to decorate them, say, oh, and by the way, this is what type it is. Yeah, but that's the, the so XML has exercise type for this. So there's the X, XML schema instance um, namespace um, and the schema instance spec and the XSI um, schema instance namespace gives you a type system that you can can apply to any any particular element. So the default is that they're text, and then you can go and constrain them. You can co constrain them further down. So you you make an element called foo, and then you have an attribute there which is XSI colon type, and then in in that in that attribute you declare the XML schema simple type that that field shall have. Right. Yeah. So it's yes, uh, and I, I guess mentally, I think that collides with my. Um, but that is the exact efficiency thing. Yeah. But I get. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Exactly equivalent to what you have in JSON, right? In JSON, you have implied types by 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 the way how you format the damn string, and by with XML, you have an explicit type system you invoke effectively on an attribute um, to declare what's what that text is, is supposed to be. And, and nice. yes, it, it runs long. But that's XML, right? Yep. No, yeah, I get it. Does it so allow this differentiate sorry. between uh, uh, URI and URI reference attribute types? Yes. Cool. So I'm not sure, I'm sure I followed where you guys landed on that, but I'm wondering why it doesn't look like this. 
that, that that's essentially what they're saying. But yeah. they um, that so for instance, the ID element will be decorated with an attribute that says XSI colon type equals XS string or something. Like that. No, it doesn't have to be. So all the extensions would have. All the extensions would have to do that. Yes, because, anything that's not defined would have to do yeah. that. Yes, and, and so there's an implied there's an implied type. They're implied they're all strings, but if they're different, then you would have to go in, and, and that's the same with the JSON, right? Everything is a string unless you make it otherwise. Yeah. So I mean, I can go with that. Just a small tweak. So yeah, I, um, if if people think that's a good direction, that looks good, more natural. It, yeah, does, it does. It does definitely look more natural from a document perspective. Yeah, it's definitely more stru structurally following the the cloud event model. From a yeah an aesthetic perspective, um, it looks a little odd having cloud event being Pascal cased and then ID being um, all lowercase. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of ludicrous, but yes. <laughs> I, I suspect that would feel more natural when writing documents. It, would everyone be happy enough with that? Yeah, Doing this? Yeah, that's fine. Well, it, I like consistency and the fact that we lowercase everything anyway for ours, that seems consistent to do it here too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know, I know you, Jim, you said that um, these are all machine readable anyway and screw the user. I actually like the idea of a user being able to look at the output from JSON and then XML and be able to say, oh, I can naturally see the mapping back and forth between the two. I think if anything, it's only going to make life easier for someone who actually wants to code this up. Just, just yeah, my- No, fine. I, and I would, but I would still be looking to put all the extensions in a, in a, in a bag. Oh, so you're going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> so you want a bag around this dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Well, I mean, otherwise, you know, what's a parser meant to do? How does it know whether it's looking at, um, I guess, the, what we're really saying, and maybe it's what uh, Clemens was saying, you know, anything after data, maybe, you treat as an extension. And if it doesn't match the, the model you have for a, an extension, then it's illegal. I, I would be reticent to differentiate between built-in uh, attributes and uh, built-in optional attributes and extension attributes for the yeah. same reason we've got elsewhere that they might be adopted later on. Uh, so the ordering, I would prefer to see all attributes come before data um, yeah. and include type information where appropriate. And so, are we, do we reserve data as thou shalt not use an extension attribute called data? Because I know it used to be an attribute and isn't now. Yes. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Jason, Jason is, a, I mean, what we do in Jason, we can just as well do here, right? I don't yeah. think there's a need, there's a need to go and do things much differently than we do in Jason and Jason, we just throw it all into the object. Exactly. I don't, I don't like the idea of treating anything special for, because otherwise, otherwise all we're doing is revisiting the entire bag extension discussion yeah. all over again. But I mean, you, you, so you, in the JSON model, you have a separate tag for binary data. Yeah. So what you're saying is have a tag for binary data and have another tag for data, which is either, you know, an XML document or text. We have a type. So the difference between JSON and, and XML is that, that in, in XML, we actually have a type system a hint that it's base 64 data. Basics for binary. So yeah, exercise type. Special. Oh, you would use exercise type for that. Okay. Yeah. So in exercise type, there is a there is a. But I have to go read this stuff again. But um um yeah, there is a base sixty four um, yeah. declaration. Yeah, there is. There is because I've used that already. Okay. Let me let me mentally um, let me have a crack at reworking that. Okay. Okay. Technically, we're out of time. Good discussion. Um, that was all, all of a sudden showing up with XML in this in this talk was not what was, it was expecting out of this day. Yes. Okay. Seaborn, Seaborn, next, Clemens. <laughs>
So, so please comment on the PR itself directly, um, and then we'll see how how much work Jim can get done for next week. Simon, yeah, drop, maybe, I did, sorry, Doug. I would just say maybe hold off on the comments until I've had a chance to uh, iterate on it. Good. Okay, sounds good. Okay, did I miss anybody for attendee for the for the attendee list? I don't think so. I think I just Simon took off before I got a chance to ask him. Okay, in that case, if you are not doing discovery, you are free to go and have a good rest of your day. Otherwise, please stick around if you're doing the discovery interrupt stuff. Bye, everybody. Ba -da -ba -ba. Right. Okay. Um, I think we lost everybody who we're going to lose. So where are we with respect to actually doing testing here? Um, to be honest, I'm getting a little worried. Um, I know, and I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not going to imply people are, are slackers or anything. It's just, I know everybody's really, really busy. So people haven't, haven't had time to do it. Uh, for, so for example, I know Scott wants to do stuff and I pinged him about it yesterday, but he said he's really, really busy on Knative 1.0 release. So that's keeping him way too busy to work on this. But anybody else want to chime in in terms of where they are relative to coding up their stuff so we can think about starting to test anytime soon? Yeah, so I can say that. Um, I don't have endpoints published into this document yet, but I have a uh, implementation that is wrapping um, uh, effectively an Azure, complete Azure resource group. And you can discover all the events that are being raised from those Azure resources, and you can go and subscribe to all of them. So I have a effectively a complete shim with Discovery API and Subscriptions API around the native uh, eventing capabilities of EventGrid. Um, and that, so that's something that has been have been sitting has been sitting around for a while now. Um, and I just haven't been able to go in and publish the endpoint because the, la the, la the, the last work is I need to go and create a resource group and, and I need to create a thing that actually does, does stuff. Like I need to go and have a, you know, create some, some blobs and, and so I need to make the thing active so it actually raises events. But it's, so I need to have, I need to write an app for the shim, right? So I haven't done that yet. Uh, I, I will promise that I will do that um, at the beginning of next week. So I'll, I'll have I'll publish the endpoint, and you'll be able to go and interact with it. I'm a little the, the thing I'm worried about, um, frankly, is um, um, access control. <laughs> hmm. um, so I I'm not sure yet how to deal with this. Um, do we have? Um, I don't know how much we can, we one can constrain those things. Yeah, we haven't, <clears throat> to be honest, we haven't even talked about that. But the other thing I was going to ask you is, it, I mean, it sounds really cool from just an, a, from a random implementation perspective, but what does it mean in terms of testing? Because one of the things that we talked about in the past for, for a testing perspective is to get a little bit of consistency in terms of yeah, what people can expect in the endpoint itself. So will you be able to have discovery endpoint services that match some of the stuff we talked about in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm allowing, I'm, I, I am exposing effectively a real thing that has this discovery API and the subscription API. But like, this is how, it's effectively a preview of how, how that might look in the product. Right, as long as the services you can do are, are not fixed to be real Azure services and you can put in there something like a ping service or something like that. Then I think we're good. Uh, you will be able to hook up a custom topic, and that custom topic can then go and raise whatever events. Yes. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, so I said I'm, I'm, I have the I have all the basic code. I have some some stuff to to finish, but I've done a substantial amount of work, and um, I so I will promise here with that I will have. Um, that's available for consumption by this time next week. How about that? Okay, cool. Okay, that's, that'd be great, yeah. Because I need to do some more work on mine, but I think mine is pretty far along and I would love to have somebody else to hook up to and start chatting with. So that'd be good. We can maybe sync up next week. Yeah. Cool. 
Okay, anybody else on the call wanna chime in? I don't think we have any of these folks, unfortunately. Okay. Um, okay, is there anything else we need to discuss then? I'm hoping Cummins, to be honest with you, that if, if you and I start having our implementations talk to one another, I'm hoping that puts pressure on everybody else to, to try to find time. So yes, that'd be good if we can do that next week. We're gonna pressure them all into compliance. That's right. <laughs> I could make some political statements, but I won't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else people want to bring up relative to the discovery interrupt at all? Otherwise, we will adjourn really early. Yeah. All right. Means, cool. Next um, say it again. Which means I'm going to get to get to go to the next meeting, which is already going. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. In that case, have a good day, everybody. Talk to you again next time. Bye. Okay. Bye, everybody.